<laughs> Hi friends, Papa Dale here. We are continuing our Bible Nutshells series. Today's Bible Nutshell is number 104, End Times, the Tribulation. And these nutshells are not exhaustive theological studies, but they are nutshells of the most important doctrines and teachings of the historic orthodox evangelical christian church and the purpose for creating them is twofold one to uh, teach and edify and build up the, the christian community so that they will know more about our lord and savior jesus christ and in addition to that uh, we do believe that there's going to be a rapture coming up real soon and uh, the Christians are all going to be out of here. They're going to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus. That's going to leave nobody left on earth that can really teach uh, with truth and authority what the Bible uh, means. So I'm leaving this as a legacy of content that perhaps the Holy Spirit can use to, to uh, give to people who are left behind and uh, who want to know. So that's the purpose. Well, who am I? I'm Papa Dale. I am a retired pastor, teacher, uh, evangelist, theologian, <laughs> Christian ed director, just about every job you can think of that can be done in the Christian church. I've done at one time or another. And um, I've left a, uh, a video on each of my Bible-related playlists that tells you a little bit more about my educational background and my Christian service background. And it's important that you know that about your teachers, your Bible teachers, because Scripture says that many false teachers will be going out into the world in these end times. And um, you need to check every one of them out, including me, and make sure that what they teach you is consistent and congruent with what the scripture teaches. So, having said that, again, this is uh, Bible Nutshell number 104, uh, End Times, the Tribulation, and off we go. After Revelation chapter 3, when John is called up to heaven, come up hither, he hears a voice say, that's in Revelation 4.1, the church is thereafter not seen on the earth again. John may here represent the raptured church. And it also may be, the raptured church also may be represented by the elders in Revelation 4 as the church at worship. See Revelation 4 verse 10. On the earth, Israel is busy coming to belief in Christ, testifying to him as Messiah, and suffering persecution and martyrdom. Matthew twenty four sixteen. This includes the reconstitution of a literal Jewish nation, the 144,000, and the two witnesses who can't be killed, all preaching the gospel. A future temple is seen as literal as well. A future Antichrist, a future seven-year peace covenant between Israel and her enemies, a future false prophet, a future worldwide conspiracy to destroy Israel, and more. Three positions have developed over the years relative to the timing of the catching away or the rapture of the church that Paul revealed in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. In Greek, the word translated caught up is harpazo. We get the English word rapture from its Latin translation, repemur, a catching away or snatching up by force. It is first seen in this context in Jerome's Latin Bible, the Vulgate, translated in AD 382. The basic doctrine on which all premillennialists agree is that believers will be transformed from mortality to immortality and will be caught up into the air to meet a waiting Christ. See 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. The question is, when, in the order of events, does this occur? The basic positions are called pre-tribulational, 
mid-tribulational, and post-tribulational. They are differentiated whether this catching up happens before, in the midst of, or after the period called the trib tribulation, Matthew twenty four twenty one. This is a time characterized principally by great worldwide turmoil on earth because of the activity of Satan through the Antichrist and because of the physical catastrophic judgments of God. The pre-tribulational position sees the churches being rescued out of the world just before the seventh week of Daniel, see Daniel 9. This is described as a seven-year period that begins with great peace and prosperity that lasts for three and a half years, and then in rapid succession, God's judgments begin to manifest, his wrath against sin in the form of great plagues, pestilence, famines, earthquakes, and wars overwhelm the planet. The devastation is so ubiquitous as to affect every living soul. But believers are no longer in physical form on the earth. They've been rescued before God's judgment on sin fell. Quote, God hath not, God hath not appointed us, believers, to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 Therefore, the catching up is seen as a rescue, much like Noah's rescue from the great flood judgment on the earth in his day. See Genesis 7.7. 7. So one of the things uh, that I wanted to mention is that um, I said that great peace and prosperity lasts for about three and a half years. There's a mix. There's a mix of prosperity as early on in the period um, as uh, the Antichrist gains control and brings world order about. But then quite quickly, in that first three and a half years, things begin to change and uh, there is war and famine and death that very rapidly comes all on the face of the earth. The traditional belief is that there are no warning signs for this catching away. But all of the aforementioned judgments of God are the warnings that the second coming of Christ is near. Because these two events occur so closely together in time, about seven years apart, the concepts are often confused and conflated, and the warning signs for the latter are often misapplied to the former. What we can know, however, is that these warning signs, as we see them coming upon the earth, these warning signs for the second coming of Christ uh, are a telltale sign that the rapture must be pretty near as well. Uh, Jesus said that we can know the season, and that's one of the ways we can know. Uh, let's see. Nevertheless, the catching away of the church and the second coming of Christ are two different events with two different purposes and two different conclusions. The catching away is to rescue the church. This is said to be the comfort Paul speaks of in 1 Thessalonians 4.18. The believers meet Christ in the air. He is seen only by believers, leaving a mystery for those left behind to wonder over, namely, where did all the Christians go? They are instantly transformed from mortality to immortality, then given rewards and enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. See John 14.3, 1 Corinthians 15.51-54, 1 Thessalonians 4.18, 16-18, and 2 Thessalonians 2.1. The second coming is Christ's return to judge the earth and establish his kingdom seven years after the rapture of the church. He comes as a powerful judge, righteously angry at sin. He is seen by all living people, Revelation 1.7. He touches down on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14.4, and we observe as he destroys his enemies, Matthew 24 and 25, 
Luke 21, Mark 13, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. The mid-tribulational position is similar to the traditional pre-tribulational position. Both see the tribulation period as the prophetic fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. See Daniel chapter 7. The tribulation period, they believe, is seven years long, but divided into halves. The church must endure great hardships for the first three and a half years. Remember, I just said... Early on in that three and a half years, it's going to be relatively smooth sailing and prosperity, but then very quickly it changes. And then in the second three and a half years is the most extreme judgment of God. This is after the abomination of desolation pollutes the restored temple. See Daniel 9, uh, 27. The church is seen as being rescued or raptured from the middle of the full seven-year time period. A less popular but growing idea is called the pre-wrath rapture. It's virtually identical to the mid-tribulational position, but has variations in the possible timing of events. Its principal point is that believers will not be on the earth when the wrath of God is poured out. The post-tribulational position sees the church going through the tribulation. The rationale is found in the idea that the church must be purged of any last vestiges of sin. Support for this is seen in the parable of the ten foolish virgins. Pardon me. Awaiting the bridegroom to arrive, some of the wedding congregants were not as prepared as others and ran out and ran out of lamp oil in the middle of the night. They left to buy more, but upon their return, found the marriage supper had begun without them, and they were shut out. The pushback is that the parable teaches the wisdom of readiness, not the doctrine of exclusion of certain believers. If you're saved, you're saved. The church is purified by the blood and work of Jesus on the cross, not by purification added to the work of Christ by persecutions. Justification is declared because God accepts believing dynamic faith as righteousness. See Romans 4.3. Sanctification, on the other hand, or the process of becoming Christ-like, is progressive. It is a different concept than justification. No one fully achieves it until we are translated, and that is the work of God, not ourselves. See 1 Corinthians 15, 36 through 46. Quote, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. The most popular and commonly held position among evangelicals is therefore premillennial and pre-tribulational, and it is the most faithful to the proper exegesis of the whole scripture. Now remember, you can, you can take a passage here and a passage there in scripture, and you can make it mean most anything you want to, especially if you're allegorizing or spiritualizing that scripture. But if you look at scripture in its entire context, in the passage that the verses appear, in the chapter that it appears, in the book that it appears, in the whole context of the whole Bible, that's the only way you can know that you are properly exegeting the scripture. Otherwise, you may be eisegeting, you may be reading into the scripture your preconceptions. So proper exegesis is what's needed. And also, as discussed earlier, you need to hold to uh, literal, plain, common language translation of passages unless they are extremely fantastic and it's just impossible to 
uh, interpret them plainly and literally. So those are my final comments on uh, the end times, the tribulation. Um, if you have comments, questions, or prayer requests, you can leave them below at the uh, bottom of the video, and uh, I'll be I'll be happy to uh, read them and uh, and answer them. Also, uh, there's a link to my Facebook page where you can leave them, and uh, in addition, there's a link down there uh, that'll take you right to the notes that we just went through, and you can take your time going through the notes and you can look up the scripture verses for yourself and I highly recommend that you do that don't believe me you believe the Bible and you believe what the Holy Spirit tells you uh, and that's the best thing that I can teach you is that right there you you read the Bible for yourself you read it all in context and you believe what the Holy Spirit teaches you about it so that's it for uh, Bible Nutshell number 104, End Times, Tribulation. Now the next video is going to be really special. And I say that because it is not a historic Orthodox teaching of the Evangelical Christian Evangelical Church. <laughs> it is the ideas of yours truly as applied to the millennium and the tribulation. And uh, I think I stand on good exegetical ground for them, but there are a few slight differences between what I think is, is happening and going to happen and uh, what the traditional premillennial, pre-tribulational view teaches. I am a pre-millennialist, I am a pre-tribulationalist, but I do have just a a couple of different ideas about it. So the next video is going to be number 105, Papa Dale's View. <laughs> so you look forward to that. I know I will. And uh, it's going to be fun. So uh, I remember I'm not a prophet. Uh, I, I'm not in this view when I start teaching this view. And I'll mention this again. I'm not going to be saying thus saith the Lord. But these are just uh, my thoughts. Okay? Just my thoughts. That's all. Just my thoughts. So, this is Papa Dale saying until next time, I'm signing off and I'm telling you to be well and be blessed. <laughs>